Hello, AP World History students. Uh, today we're going to finish up the unit on religious and philosophical belief systems in the world with one on one that I'm pretty excited about, and it's called postmodernism. And the reason why it's very complicated, very difficult to understand, but I think this is where we're at in the world right now. And so I think this particular video is going to help out a lot to explain a lot of really relevant issues, not only to global history, but to, I think, in order to understand like what's going on today and sort of our our culture wars between different groups as they're fighting it out um, over these different issues. So the big argument that I'm going to be making throughout this PowerPoint is that there's this transition we're making um, from the past, from what are known as traditional beliefs to what are known as modernist beliefs to today postmodernist beliefs that really are a critique on the idea that we can have any kind of like universal ideas that fit for all people, that really in the end we have to think more local and we have to try to respect the different types of traditions in local areas. That's the idea of, of postmodernism. So in order to understand this, we do need to go back to the period before postmodernism and understand uh, traditionalism versus modernism. Before we do, I want to quickly talk about what's called worldviews. So the idea of a worldview is that we have certain like values or ways of looking at not just the world in the sense of like a literal sense, nor is it about a specific issue, but rather what are our overall values or foundations in the way that we look at the world that help us to interpret things that are going on in the world. So two of like the initial ones are traditionalism versus modernism. So in the post-classical period, the ideology was a traditionalist one that stressed things like filial obligations or extended family relationships built around hierarchy. Think of Chinese Confucianism. Uh, another big one was patriarchy, male-centered societies. But be careful of this, and this is going to be important for what we talk about later on. Patriarchy is not just the sense of a male leader. It's the sense of male values or symbols of male values. Things like, for example, competitiveness or seeing the world as being black and white decision making. It, it's either or. Um, also, hierarchies are really important within patriarchies. And then last up, it's called organic societies, meaning societies that are built around traditional roles that basically over time, the idea is traditions have built up over time um, that are based upon our wisdom passed down from generation to generation. Now, after the post-classical period is the modern period of ideology. So this is like the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, and really for what's happened for the last like 300 years. The modern period or its worldview focused around individualism, the individual's autonomy to become the most important value. So what does that mean? Meaning that an individual has to be able to choose for him or herself. Um, equality becomes very important, that really all roles and responsibilities have to be questioned. And we have to ask, you know, was a role or responsibility given to people, is that arbitrary or is there a really good reason for having that? And then last up, the atomic society. So within the sort of like traditional society, the symbol of it is organic or what's known as like the body. So you oftentimes hear like the body politic or the body society, in which societies are viewed as almost like being a human body. Everything's interconnected. Within the modern society, the idea is more of an atomic society, meaning we are all like connected to each other, but loosely connected. And we're like atoms. We, we are chaotic. We jump around and bump against up, up against each other. But in the end, by doing that, we create sort of this competitive world in which the eventual consequences create its own like chaotic order. So in order to understand the modern period, we need to go back to the Enlightenment. In the Enlightenment, there are a lot of different thinkers, but the basic values are the natural rights, the idea that individuals are entitled to something. So you think of like John Locke with the idea of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of private property. Um, also democracy, the idea that there should be not only a check on government or voting in government, but democratic values like the sentiment towards individualism, equality, in the marketplace of competition, and not just competition in the sense of economic goods, but also in the sense of like ideas as well. Uh, then there was the suspicion of organized religion, best exemplified by the man Voltaire. So Voltaire criticized traditional religious beliefs and said, you know, um, all these traditional religious beliefs that people are bought into are really just based upon suspicion and they're based upon prejudices. And by prejudices, he doesn't mean the way we think of it today. Uh, prejudices are much more based upon this idea of like believing in traditions without really questioning them or asking if there's a real purpose to them. So how do we find out if there's a purpose of something? Well, we can use this scientific method. So the scientific revolution provides this hope that if we use empiricism or the observation of empirical things that we can eventually find the evidence or the truth of how they work. So some challenges to the Enlightenment. So after the Enlightenment is done, the first major challenge comes from the Romantics. 
The Romantics criticize the Enlightenment for stressing human rationality. For a Romantic, this gets rid of all of our emotions. It gets rid of the idea of intuition. It gets rid of what makes us humans. It's much more than being rational. A good example of this was the reaction to a man named Immanuel Kant. Kant was a modernist. He claimed that all human beings could use their minds to eventually create universal claims of ethics. So like, for example, why should I not lie? I mean, what's wrong with doing that? What, what, I mean, what's the reason behind it? Or is this just an arbitrary rule? Well, I shouldn't lie because it's contradictory. If I can lie, other people can lie. So if people can't trust me, I can't trust them. How do we have a society, right? So we can create these universal rules using our minds. But romantics claim this is just ridiculous. That, yeah, sure, we can claim some of these rational rules. But in the end, what really makes us a human being? Well, we're products of our local culture, our nationality, and for them, the soil. And if you think about it, they were a farming society. So that, that's where they're coming from at that time period. Romantics claim that, look, what makes us human beings is far beyond our rationality. We are emotional, intuitional creatures. I mean, you can think about this for yourself. I mean, what do you really value? What you learn at school and classrooms? Probably. I mean, those are important things. But in the end, my guess is it's your relationships. It's your connections with family. It's your connections with friends. Eventually, a romantic connection with somebody. These are what we value much more. Because what makes us truly human is not that we're not rational, but that our emotions and our intuition are just so much more important to us. Another challenge to the Enlightenment, or challenges Enlightenment number two, come from traditional cultures. Cultures in the developing world, they reacted against European imperialism. So Europeans came in, and not only did they extract resources and extract labor, but in the African, Asian, and Mesoamerican nations, there was a criticism of what was known as cultural imperialism. The idea that Europeans were imposing their values, especially competitive individualism on them. African, Asian, and Mesoamerican leaders said, look, we believe in things like elders, wisdom, community, and tradition. And, you know, in some ways, like the big criticism of this is that these countries have led to very authoritarian leaders uh, because of a, a like trust in over over elders and, and tradition. But you could make the argument that, you know, all they were basically saying was that, you know, where do we get our truth from? Well, from families. We get it from our traditions, from our communities, and we support one another. Kind of as, again, like things like Hinduism, or it's like Chinese Confucianism, or like the Latin American cultures. Like, do we really even today believe in strict individualism, or don't we look for our traditions from our families and from our, our parents, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles? This was the challenge of the developing world, that they didn't want to buy into this notion of competitive individualism. The next big challenge that came was the world wars. Now, this is not an ideological challenge so much as it is the world wars themselves, but it's based upon a criticism of technology and rationality. You know, on the one hand, Enlightenment stress that we just use rationality and technology, we're going to have human progress. But what do we end up with? World War I, humans use mass-produced weapons to kill over 10 million people. In World War II, humans use science to categorize min minorities, like Jewish people are before this, Armenians, or eventually other racial minorities as a threat. And then uh, the need for elimination through technology. And then, to finish things, humans created nuclear weapons that could use fission technology, the ability to break down atoms at their most basic level to destroy whole cities. In other words, the criticism coming out of the world wars was that science and technology was not always leading to direct progress. In fact, it oftentimes led to killing whole populations systematically. Still, after World War II was done, modernism had seemed to win. In the 1950s, fascism had been destroyed. Uh, major powers then turned to things like capitalism and democracy. In fact, the United States, as we've talked about before, formed major economic alliances like the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Think about what that symbolized. Rules that basically were creating an industrial competitive marketplace. Or the World Bank symbolized the economic power of Europe and the United States to develop industries all around the world in developing countries. But then we got challenges again to this notion. So the first one came from feminism. And the challenge was this notion that there was this sort of like universal law of how people should act. So the first wave of feminism started up back in the 1800s, and it was the women's fight for suffrage. Also at that same time, we got some major thinkers, a French woman named Olympe de Gauche, and also Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote The Vindication on the Rights of Women. Both of them argue, you know, women have been described and universally described as being emotionally fragile and incapable of higher thought. And they argue, you know, if women were given the same educational opportunities as men, they not only could vote, they could demonstrate they were intellectually equal. That leads up to, right after World War II, the second wave of feminism, which questioned women's roles in society. Two women, Betty Friedan and Simone de Beauvoir, 
Uh, Betty Friedan in The Feminine Mystique argued that women had been told that that universally they their job was to be at home. And if they just had kids and raised their kids and took care of their husband, they would be happy. Both Betty Friedan and Simone de Beauvoir argued that just the opposite was happening, that women actually were being limited to the private sphere and they were finding themselves miserable in the private sphere because they weren't allowed to use their intellectual abilities. Eventually, they began to question the issue of dividing women and men based upon inherent traits. Finally, this has led to what we're living in now, the third way, which questions if there really is any difference between men and women, or aren't these just gender differences? In other words, cultural stereotypes. So the difference between sex versus gender. Sex meaning our biological differences, which obviously there are differences between men and women based upon our ability to reproduce, or based upon even some basic differences in our brain functions. But the question really has come up, are they really that significant, or are these things that we have created through gender? Now, how does this have anything to do with modernism? Well, if it's true that men and women and gender are not so easily black and white issues, easily defined, then it brings up a question about whether anything can be universally categorized and then broken up into different groups. And that led into a questioning of science itself. So right after World War II, there was a man named Thomas Kuhn. And Thomas Kuhn argued that scientific discoveries in self science is not based upon this observation of nature that's just absolute, but rather it's an evolution. And it's an evolution of discovery based upon paradigms or how we view the world. Like the biggest example he brought up was the change in physics from Newton to Einstein. Newton argued that basically there were these exact rules of cause and effect. Einstein came along and said, yeah, that's true. Here on Earth, the things we observe are based upon cause and effect. But what happens when we start to get into more of like the universe level in which we're moving as fast as the speed of light? Then everything ends up being relative. In other words, our paradigms, the way we look at the world, change our focus. The atomic bombs raise the question of, well, even if science was right on things, what are its moral limits? I mean, we can create the atomic bombs, but ought we to create the atomic bombs? So the question came up about science being based upon this desire to control nature for the sake of progress. And then progress got criticized. Basically, it was criticized as being this way to kind of like force people into believing into modernism. In other words, it was a way to criticize, it was a way to silence critics. Which brings up the question, you know, is science really just absolutely true? Or is it its own philosophy that's used as an agenda to sort of like silence people who disagree? But then in the midst of all that, science has now produced this belief in what's called global warming, or that our release of carbon dioxide into the world is warming up the planet. Now, if that ends up being true, and there's a lot of evidence right now it could be, then that means that industrial progress itself coming off of modernism is under question. At the same time, we have another source of criticism about modernism, and it comes from radical Islam. Radical Islam has challenged the values of modern Western states. Radical Muslims argue that, you know, modern Western states have gone out and they have imposed themselves on traditional religions like Islam in the, in the Middle East. They've criticized um, the fact that, uh, that modern Western states don't value authority. They don't value community. They value things like materialism and they allow for what they would call loose sexual values. Osama bin Laden wanted to create, so what was he after? He wanted to create a Muslim caliphate, a kingdom, that would stretch from Africa to East Asia. And in his belief, once that got established, he would establish a traditional uh, religious culture based upon the values of community authority, non-materialism, and traditional sexual values. Notice what's happening here. Radical Islam really is challenging this idea that the model of the United States, the model of Europe, can fit everywhere in the world. So this leads up to postmodernism. Postmodernism is a belief that knowledge is not discovered, it's constructed through frameworks or worldviews. We create narratives, narratives or stories about the way that the world and the social order operates. The problem, according to postmodernism, is that the Enlightenment tried to make us think that meta narratives are real and universal. But for a postmodernist, our language and our reasoning are just tools. They're used as a way to gain a goal by the actor. So like, for example, go back to that idea of progress. We just believe progress to be real and that progress is just something that has happened. A postmodernist would say, no, the language of progress makes it sound like anybody who would criticize that has to be anti-progress and bad. But what do we really have for the last 500 to 600 years? Well, we have European imperialism. We have the world wars. We have the attempt to oppress women. We have the attempt to oppress minorities. And today we face the possibility of global warming. So while it is true that 
global living standards have gone up, poverty has gone down, disease has gone down. The problem is progress makes us think it's all good. And why would we look for anything different? The significance of postmodernism is that, according to it, all arguments are stories. And they need to be deconstructed so we can show what the real agenda is. So, takeaways. The big takeaways I want you to take from this sort of following, this is where we end off now of where we're at today. Modernism was based upon this belief, and it comes out of Europe and America, about rationality, science, and individualism, and that this leads to progress. Modernism eventually got challenged by the world wars, developing nations, feminist philosophies on the difference between sex and gender. And science itself has now been criticized for both its lack of morality and its lack of being able to get the entire real truth on the natural world. So what does postmodernism leave with us? Well, it challenges us to reconstruct our meta narratives. Instead of having these universal stories, instead, we should call for the respect of multicultures, ethnic and gender identities. And of course, today, we have people both supporting this as well as criticizing it and trying to figure a way forward. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Bye.